welcome. If you haven't been to any of our webinars before um, or we haven't met, I'm Julie Pinky. I'm the founder of JM Pinky Partners and the Spa Hive. And what we're um, doing is a 14 week series of building your foundation blocks back so you're prepared for your grand reopening. Um, not focusing so much on PPE and um, all of those things, but really the foundation of your business. And we're bringing you experts in the industry that have been in your shoes and that can help you be successful as you have this hindsight is 2020, right? We have this amazing time that we've never had before to look at our businesses in different ways. So welcome. Um, please use the chat function because we are in webinar um, on Mondays. So if you have any questions as we're going along, if you're not familiar with Zoom, down at the bottom, you'll see a chat function. Go ahead and drop any questions in the chat function. And we'll be monitoring both. We have support uh, monitoring and I'll be monitoring as our guest panelists are chatting. Um, if you want to switch your view right now, I have a gallery view so that I can see everybody at once. If you want speaker view, then you can go ahead in the up, upper right corner, I think is on most people's screen, you can switch the view to what you want to see and who you want to see when they're speaking. Um, so I'd like to welcome our panelists. I have Jennifer Beauclair. Jennifer is the beauty in red. She um, is the spa director at the spa, the Foxwoods, what is it? Norwich Spa at Foxwoods. <laughs> um, so Foxwoods Resort and Casino located in Connecticut um, where they are not open yet. Um, then I have Jen Ross Bosch's she, so we have two Jens. She's the owner of Beauty Mark, which is an amazing spa in Portland, Maine, um, where she has a very high-end exclusive skincare business. She's going to talk to you about that. And then we have Lynn Banter. She is an amazing spa owner in New Jersey. Um, so we kind of have the so corners of the Northeast covered. We also have a little bit for everyone because you know, Jennifer Beauclair is a corporate spa, you know, big operation, monster business. Um, Lynn has your medium sized business and Jen has, you know, is a more small business owner. So we can get all of their viewpoints and hopefully give you everything that you need as we talk about this daunting topic of um, compensation, which we know could be like a whole day, maybe a four part webinar series on its own. Um, but, you know, let's dive in. So let's see, we have a quick PowerPoint. It's not something, you know, that we're going to have a very open dialogue today. Um, but I wanted to give you a small takeaway as I'm doing that. I'd love for each of our panelists to introduce themselves. Let us know the compensation model that you currently use in your business, how you came to that, and if you've been um, successful or if there's been room for improvement. And let's start with um, Jen Beauclair from Connecticut. Okay. So I'm the spa director at the Norwich Spa at Foxwoods, and we are currently on a compensation only structure, which was not what they had previously. Previously, it was hourly based, um, based on seniority. Um, the highest, I think, went up to 17 or $18 that was for employees that had been there, you know, 15 plus years. And then they also had at that time a minimum wage 
hourly for when they were not seeing guests. So all their downtime, they were being paid hourly. Now we're street commission. They're only compensated when they are working on guests or if they are training. So no downtime pay. Um, it's actually been really, really great for us. It was amazing for morale. Um, you know, if somebody was getting paid, let's say $15 for the hour to do a signature massage, there really wasn't much motivation for them to upgrade, to add on, because their hourly was their hourly, regardless of what they were doing. So although it was a huge undertaking and, you know, it was a little probably frightening <laughs> for the company to consider because initially, you know, it is a lot, it's a lot of money going out. It's a lot more money than what they, what the compensation was hourly. However, once we changed that, the amount of upgrades, the add-ons went through the roof. So it was hugely successful. The only place that we did not see success was in the hair department. Um, we had a very small department as it was. Um, you know, and most of these stylists, the clientele have been going there for a million years. So it's not a lot of new clientele in the casino. Um, you know, a lot of people don't want to walk in from the street and have to go through the casino to get their hair done um, or maybe try something, try a new stylist, I guess, if they're away. So for them, they were the ones that struggled a little bit. So anybody that didn't already have an existing clientele, it was difficult to hire stylists and get them to stay. Um, what I did figure out, which worked pretty well to get around that, was I would hire them in as receptionists, mostly receptionists, um, one nail tech as well and then apply them as a secondary stylist. So that they still had the ability to earn while they didn't have their hair clients. And then it also gave them more flexibility to build. Thanks, John. You are welcome. And, was there uh, another piece I missed? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, I was gonna ask a quick question, um, but my little was in here throwing a fit trying to escape her papa so I lost my train of thought but we'll come back to it <laughs> and um beauty mark Jen let's talk about your business um you I know you're a, a small business um let's talk about you know your business your business model your compensation model also your growth and, you know, your conscious decision to, you know, downsize into one spa from two, et cetera, a little bit for our audience. Um, well, hi, welcome. I'm glad to be here. My name's Jen Boshes. I'm in Beauty Mark is in Portland, Maine. We are a specialized skin clinic. Uh, I had another location for 10 years in Camden, Maine. And prior to just doing skincare at one point when I started the business, I was a full service spa. Over the years, I have um, gotten more and more specialized and found that skincare is what works for my business. I'm a licensed esthetician myself. I love advanced skincare and I want to raise the bar in that um, area. So the other services sort of fell off over the years. Um, Having said that, that's made commission um, my form of payment for my my employees. Um, prior to that, I was doing some hourly, some commission, but now I've only hired estheticians that have been in the field for a really long time. So they're highly skilled. They're motivated by training um, and by retail sales and more education. So over the years, um, you know, if they can kind of control how much money they're going to make by taking another class or being more engaged when I do have trainers come in, 
and also with their retail sales. I um, look at our pricing quite frequently too. So they, you know, every year I adjust services and adjust pricing and that helps my employees. So we're constantly working together as a team. I think having a smaller team for me has been a lot better. Um, in the past, I've come into problems with retail with a, with because a, I do pay 10% on retail with a larger team. You know, some people just expected if their client walked through the door, they would just, and they weren't working, they would just automatically get the retail. Well, sure, if they, you know, made the recommendation, they would, but if their client is just coming in to replenish, they wouldn't. And so that, when I had a larger team, that was trickier, but now that it's smaller, um, I make it very streamlined, specific, and that seems to work for everybody. Um, am I missing anything? No, well, talk to us a little bit. I mean, and, and this is not the topic of our conversation today, but talk to us a little bit about, I always am intrigued, and, and this can lead us down a rabbit hole, so I probably shouldn't ask it right now because I think we can have the conversation between all of us in a minute, but Tell us your um, service to retail percentage. So retail sixty percent of my business now. That's With amazing. Hopefully, fingers crossed, a little bit more growth this year. I mean, <laughs> we we just we do a lot in terms of retail. Like we're very active with social media, with our web presence. Um, our estheticians actually love to sell retail. Um, we think it's a disservice to our clients if they're not getting retail from us. We're the experts. We take time recommending a full regime for them. They could be buying products. From, what I'm finding right now when I'm doing consultations is people have products from so many different places, from the drugstore, from Sephora, from um, you know, other estheticians, um, you know, the list goes on and on and they're spending so much money for what their girlfriend's using instead of getting the, the proper recommendations from an expert. So we really, you know, try to focus on that with Beauty Mark. We make sure that we're reaching out to our clients um, in many different ways. Do you feel that your um, staff um, look at their retail commission as part of their income? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Awesome. I think they look at it as part of their job. <laughs> I love it. So, there, you know, it, it, you retain a client if but the chances of you retaining a client go up by 90%, something like that. I don't know. Um, if you sell them retail. And I think that just, it just helps the long-term relationship. If they look at you as the expert and you are making the proper recommendations and you're taking time, you're not just saying, oh, buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this, but take the time and make the proper recommendations and follow up. Right, right. Lifetime. So Lynn, tell us a little bit about your business. Welcome. Same Hi. question. Tell us, uh, let us have a deep dive into your business and your compensation model, which some people on the call may be less familiar with. Okay. Um, I own Spa Virtue in Tom's River. I have 10 employees. Um, seven of them are service providers. Uh, we do team-based pay. So we pay everybody hourly, every hour they're there. It's kind of um, stabilizes from the up and down a commission. So they're all, they know how much they're gonna get. They're guaranteed their hours, they're guaranteed their, their salary. They get raises by uh, reviews and, and uh, behaviors. So if they're hitting their targets, they're a great team player, they have a good attitude, we do reviews and they get raises. Then they get the same amount for every hour they're there. It's not a reduced amount if they don't have a guest. So if a guest doesn't show up, they're still getting paid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And tell us about, um, I know you've used other compensation models. What, how, what made you go this route and so, how has it worked for you? So 
I, I've been doing this 15 years. I've been doing team-based pay for almost five. In the first 10 years, that was always the biggest struggle is trying to find a fair compensation model that doesn't sink the business, right? Because they always want more and the business has to stay open. And this ended up being like getting the confidence and understanding the program. Just maybe like, okay, yeah, if you want to raise, this is what you need to do to get there. These are our numbers. This is how much percent we can put towards your payroll. So if you want more money, this is where we have to raise the number to. And they get it and they understand how much money is going out and how much coming in and what they have to do to get there. So it, it just, I have systems now in place to get them to more money and to the raises. Mm -hmm. And team-based pay, um, you don't pay a retail commission, no. right? No, it's just part of their job. So it's all built into their compensation package. Yes, yes. Well, if we hit our goals, we all get a bonus at the end of the month. So they want to sell that retail to get to the bonus. And then when we get bonuses, we get raises. So, <laughs> And you've been doing that for five years. Almost five years, I think. About four, four and a half years. Yeah. How, um, how long have most of your employees, have they been with you longer than the five years? Has yes. anybody, they have, right? Yes. Um, they've gone through the transition. Like four of them. Four of the 10, I think it's four, maybe five. Four, I think four are still with me from before that. And I do have like people that have been with me a long time though. I don't have very many that are short, you know. Right. Once right. not working out, get weeded out very quickly. So was it scary? Were they scared when you made the transition from what everybody is used to and knows to um, something like team-based pay, which we're not, 100% familiar with everyone? Well, I think that by the time I did it, I was really confident and I was, and I knew what the, where the benefits were for them in it. You know what I'm saying? That like, you know, that, that stability. And when you go to buy a house, you have that nice stable, you're not a 1099 and you're not up and down with your pay. And I was comfortable enough and I knew they'd be okay. And I knew they weren't going to be making less money. They were just going to, you know, just going to be a stable income for them. I, I mean, I prepared them and they were pretty good. Good. So, and they like it. Good. And um, question from one of our viewers is, uh, do they get tips? Of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and let's see another question for you. I can't see the questions coming in. So luckily Marianne's texting them to me. But um, what is the mix of your providers and desk people? So what do, I think you just said, what are, how many providers? I have, I have three desk people and seven providers right now. Yeah. All right. So that answers that question. Um, so we want to, what, so why did we want to talk about compensation? Why does it matter? You know, I love this saying, you're surrounded by simple, obvious solutions that can dramatically increase your income, power, influence, and success. The problem is you just don't see them. Um, and we're all faced, you know, as business owners, managers, small business owners, that how do we make changes, you know, if we can't see beyond, you know, what we're currently doing. So what we wanted to talk about today are some other options, how they're successful, um, why they're successful for these gals, and answer any questions that you have. So we um, will send the recording out, of course, and um, you'll have this little mini PowerPoint presentation. And if you have any questions at the end, we have everyone's contact details. So if you want to talk about any of these other compensation models, um, the most popular booth or room, room rental, um, which I don't recommend often, um, but I do have some clients that do room rental for various reasons, um, straight commission, a flat rate pay, team-based pay, and hourly plus commission. Now, Jen um, Beauclair, you went from hourly plus commission to straight up commission, right? Yes. We also, which I forgot to mention, we do also have 18% pass through gratuity as well on all services. That's great. 
Um, and um, beauty mark Jen, I mean, people leave gratuity at their leisure, right? Yes. But they um, usually. So like, no matter what we're paying, what our compensation mix is, um, one of the things I think that we all agree on, you know, whether it's team based pay, whether it's straight up commission, is if your payroll, with everything that's buck right in that payroll bucket, exceeds 45%, you really have an uphill battle to make a decent profit. So I think that, you know, we want to talk about that. Um, it sounds easy, right? You have this great mix, you know, I'm paying 35% commission, you know, so all my payroll can bulk into that, you know, payroll taxes and workers comp and yada yada and I'm at 45% or not you pay 50% commission and then you add all these other things in it's kind of like what we talked about last week with Betty and Nina right you have the hundred dollars that we counted out and if you're straight paying straight up 50 50% com 50 commission and it's a hundred dollar service you're left with $50 then you keep the lights on, you buy the products, you pay the receptionist, you do all these other things. And as a business owner, you know, you're making what, 30 cents on the dollar, maybe. Um, so it sounds easy to throw out this kind of commission um, formula, but it really can go wrong fast. Um, so let's talk about um, Jen from uh, Foxwoods, so Jen Beauclair, you know, talk about, you know, what the biggest challenge was when you changed commission midstream and why you went this route, like why you decided um, to go from hourly plus commission to the actual commission that you selected. Um, or an, versus another mix. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing the screen. We will send the information out so that you have um, all of these ladies' contacts details. But I want you to be able to see um, each of them as they're talking to you full screen. So Jen Beauclair. So one of the first things that I did when I began at Foxwoods was I, you know, really spent a lot of time engaging with the staff, you know, discussing what, what they thought was going right, what, you know, what maybe could use a little bit of improvement. And the turnover was very, very high. We had a handful of people you know, who maybe were day oneers, but the majority, you know, there was a ton of turnover. Um, and they just, I think, really, for the most part, didn't feel appreciated, didn't feel like they really had control over their earnings. So that's when um, I did approach corporate and, you know, discuss changing the compensation plan. The only reason for the specific percentages that I used was really just doing research and seeing what everyone else, you know, what was kind of the norm in the industry. Um, and also, I had previously worked with GSPA, which is also in Foxwoods. So we have a lot of shared employees. And I knew that that was their compensation structure. So really for us to have you know, any skin in the game and for us to attract any employees, we had to do something different. So really, um, when we finally decided to do it, you know, everybody was nervous. They had, they had had their compensation changed a couple of times. Um, so some of them were really nervous. Once we were able to do it, I think it was, I started the process in July and I believe it was complete and approved by November. November just happens to be a fantastic month for us. So, you know, we had tons of competitions already ready to go, you know, to kind of go along with the compensation change. 
and they had a magnificent over the top November, you know, so everybody was coming in and they were so thankful. And I said, all right, you need to remember this in September. You need to remember this in June. Like those are our slowest months. So, you know, I'm like, it's great right now, but you know, that's, you know, that's one of, one of the things with the commission is when it's great, it's great. And when it's, it's slow, it's not. Um, we did see a lot of the team really started picking up shifts, which was unheard of before. I could never get anybody to even stay an extra hour before. And during the slow periods, we are very careful watching the schedule. We, you know, we will rotate and they'll take a day off if they see it's going to be slow. So, you know, we try to schedule appropriately so that nobody is ever sitting there not getting paid. You know, that's obviously not something that I want to ever see happen either. So we're very, very careful about scheduling so that they can be, you know, and so the business can be busy as well. Jen, do they all make the same commission? They do. They do. And I think, you know, maybe that was one thing when we initially did it, because although they were making a significant, you know, they had a significant increase, they still had a little bit, you know, that ego. So if they had been there for 10 years and then somebody new was coming in and getting the same commission right off the bat, that, you know, some of them had a little bit of difficulty with at the beginning, but, you know, once they got used to it and they came around, everybody, again, except for the stylist, the stylist we struggled with, but um, everybody else is very, very happy with that. We did also at the same time um, have a price increase as well. So that helped a little bit soften right. the pull. Right. Um, there was a couple of questions. Now I can see the questions. Um, Let's see, none of, none of you are open right now, right? No, I'm not open. And the casino itself will open on Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, I won't be at least until second phase, which is projected to be June 20th. But, you know, as we all know, everything changes daily. So and that looks like what Connecticut's looking at right mm -hmm. now for spa. Um, Jen, um, Beauty Mark, Jen, you're not open. You're here in Portland, Maine. Um, what does your timeline look like? Do you have any idea yet? Is it end of June? Mm -mm. It's July 1st, I, but I don't know. It might be even August 1st. I don't know. It's not looking too great. But um, we can be open for retail next week. So I think what we're going to start doing is we've been doing virtual consultations. So we might be doing some in-house consultations. I think we could do that pretty safely. And we have a Vizia. So right. helps. And Lynn, I know the answer, but how about you? I know um, New they Jersey. They're not giving us anything. <laughs> New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey. <laughs> They keep saying, saying any day now, any day now, and I can't imagine that we're going to open before Maine or Connecticut. You know, so if they're looking at July, <laughs> August, I don't know what I'm looking at. <laughs> right, right. Um, and let's see, do, do any of you see, um, any of you see um, needing to shift your compensation plans when you're reopening? Uh, we won't be. I don't think I'm going to be shifting my plan per se, but I'm definitely going to be looking at my pricing because we're not going to be able to take as many people um, or we're going to space out, you know, our appointments a little bit more. And then just, you know, the pure cost of being closed this long, you know, I, I don't want to put that all on my clients, but um we're going to have to increase a little bit for sure. Mm -hmm. And Jen, I think um, your price point, what's your facial start at right now? 125. Oh, sorry. That's Other okay. Jen. <laughs> Beauty <Mark>. How many <laughs> Jen? <laughs> um, 147. Okay. And, um, you know, you have some very 
I mean, you, when someone leaves your place, it's not unheard of for them to leave um, signing a ticket of $700, right? Mm hmm Yeah. I mean, and I, I just want to say, too, about compensation. If I don't have a large team, but if I had someone come in that was new or a newer esthetician, I would then look at either a introductory pricing tier um, because I don't necessarily think it's fair for someone to pay an introductory facial fee of 147 from an esthetician that's been, you know, working on clients for 20 years from somebody that's brand new. I mean, that's something in the future as I grow, I'll, I'll look at that a little bit closer, but right now I like being highly specialized, having um, people that have been in the industry for a really long time and keeping it small, that, that's what works. But, you know, I don't know. We didn't think we were going to be closed for four or five months this year. You never know what's going to change and right. how, you know, adaptable we'll have to be. And do you have to ever, and I feel like a lot of these questions, which I'm not surprised, are focus to Jen and Jen because team-based pay people are unfamiliar with. I mean, I could very easily get behind team-based pay. Um, and I think we should talk about that a little bit more um, because unlike our panelists, there are a lot of people out there with the opportunity if they're paying 50-50 split right now, um, even 40-60, you know, now's the time to um, you know make make a shift, and let's talk about you know how we can do that. And team based pay is definitely you know worth a look. Um, and, and Lynn is more of an expert on this call than I am. I know enough to be dangerous, um, but I think that really um, getting your teams buy in, they're like owners of your business, you know? So it's like an employee owned business that they really have skin in the game, I think is so amazing. Um, but let me go through the rest of these questions because I saw one that was good to ask that we didn't talk about. Um, okay, so I just wanted to say that, you know, some of these are, are more geared towards Jen and Jen, but Jen um, Beauty Mark, your employees are employees, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I knew that because you're still paying them while you're closed. <laughs> um, but what paying straight commission, what happens if they don't make minimum wage per week? So I know, you know, your answer is probably going to be that never happens um, because you're busy. Um, Jen, that's, that's another reason why I keep it small is because I feel their books in, you know, we have a full-time receptionist, we have two, you know, a full-time and a part-time receptionist and we're just, you know, we have an online booking platform. We send out emails, social media. We do a lot to make sure that their books are filled in and then it's their job obviously to rebook their clients and, um, you know, set them up with programs, but very rarely, even in like the dead in the winter, we have gaps or openings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Knock on wood. And, <laughs> and, and so you don't, that's kind of a moot point. You don't have to worry about them hitting minimum wage in this scenario. Mm -hmm. And Lynn, you don't have to worry about that because they're earning whether they're booked or not. Right. And Jen Beauclair, do you have to manage payroll in such a way that you um, have to ever worry about them hit, making minimum wage? No, I mean, mostly, again, because of, you know, proper scheduling that doesn't happen. And, you know, if it's a really slow day and we've over scheduled the staff, they they can do an EO or they can take their time off if they choose to, you know, we don't ever force anybody out, but we haven't at all, we haven't run into it at all since we've changed. And I think it's been 
think it's been two years now. Mm -hmm. A little over two years, probably. Right. right. Um, and how... Oh, sorry. EO is early out. Sorry. <laughs> so they can request to leave early. Yes. Yep. Um, they can request. They can't demand. Exactly. <laughs> Which was another thing, actually, that we put into place um, when we first changed the compensation. That was something, you know, everyone kind of readjusting their mindset. So we had, you know, a small period of time where employees thought that if they were not booked, then they could just all, you know, gather in my office and ask to leave early. So we did change that policy. They're um, not allowed to ask unless it's their last hour of their shift. And they're still, you know, we still prefer that they don't ask, that we would be the ones that would, you know, reach out to them and say, hey, you can go or, you know, so they're, they're really good about that now. But at the beginning, that was something that I didn't really think through. So, you know, <laughs> three o'clock on a slow day, if there's four of them sitting in my office, you know that's a problem but exactly um how about you know i think lynn i mean maybe for all of you this might be a, a question but um how do you how do you schedule your appointments so the question is with this pay structure how do they earn their place on your appointment book so i think the question is you know if you do some kind of ranking or seniority um, you know, how do um, people get first place on, you know, bookings? Um, Lynn, do you want to talk about that a yeah. little? So the, one of the beauties of team-based pay is they're getting paid whether they are fully reserved or not. So we try and run everybody at 70% so we don't kill them. Um, so if I, if we, there is no pecking order in the, the schedule, like I, I'll look and go in and say, I have two massage therapists on one's hundred percent and the other one's 50. I'll move one over. And the one that was hundred percent, I'll say, thank you. Instead of like, oh my God, you just took that money away from me. Um, and then their, their job is once they're full, their job is to get each other full because we have to hit the goal as a team. So we work together as a team and, and try and like the slower people try and get them busier. They're trying to be smart about it and get everybody booked, but there is no like pecking order or anything like that. We just, we kind of do it even. We, we try and make it even and fair. So everybody's busy and everybody gets to do the cleanup and stuff. Jen Beauty Mark or Jen Beauclair, you want to hop in to see? I think one thing I've learned over the years for sure is that it, having a good spa coordinator or, or receptionist is key. Like it, the, from the start and to finish on the phone is so essential. And they look at the schedule, having somebody that is, is just quick on their feet and they're able to put um, clients into where there's gaps, making sure that they rebook with who they want to, you know, asking the right questions on the phone. So they get booked in with who they want to get booked in with. Um, and then offering up the, the times to, to fill in the schedule. I, I, I just think that position is just sometimes overlooked and so essential to a successful business. We um, book based on seniority in, in a small, small way. And that really only affects the, you know, maybe the first person could get one additional. So they're booked based on length of employment. And so they would be, you know, from left to right. However, if we have three appointments, it's going to go, the first person gets one, the second person gets one, the third person gets one, and then it starts back over. Um, obviously, we also book based on customer needs so if a customer wants a time that's going to off balance the book they get it anyway but it doesn't really again with you know great staff everybody's always watching um, we don't rebalance based on cancellations and we don't rebalance in a two-hour window so if um, I shouldn't say we don't ever 
we don't ever rebalance based on cancellation. If, if it was eight o'clock in the morning and somebody canceled at 8 PM, yes, of course we would. But if it's within their shift, we won't rebalance. Great. Um, let's see. No, 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 no. There's lots of questions. So if I didn't answer anyone's question, ask it again. I'm getting down towards the bottom though, I think. Um, and I think that we had um, a couple questions come in via email as well. So let's see, um, Deborah asks, while I understand the additional cost for PPE, it's a basic expectation that we implement, right? Moving forward, safety procedures that we implement. She's not so sure about a COVID-19 fee. Um, perhaps increasing your menu pricing going into Q1, perhaps increasing your menu prices in Q4. Um, you might lose clients. Just a thought. Did anyone, oh, then this is another question. Okay, so just a thought. Have you guys thought through when you're going to reopen? Are you going to increase your prices? I know Jen, um, Beauty Mark Jen in Portland, Maine, talked about increasing her pricing. How do you feel about adding a COVID fee? I think everyone on this call knows how I feel, but <laughs> let's see how you guys feel about a COVID fee. Um, increasing your prices, what say you um, on this situation, you know, when, when we know our cost per service is gonna go up um, and so that we're not losing our shirts. So I'll just take this really quick. Um, I'm, I'm about to launch a new website, so I was, looking at some of my services that were potentially going to be going up anyway, I'm not going to put an additional COVID fee in there. There's just, there's some, some services that just, they, they don't make any sense for us. So, you know, when you look at your menu and you see some certain things are really redundant. So I'm just going back through analyzing what works, what doesn't work, increasing a little bit here and there, not by a lot, just a little bit. Um, and I think that will help us, but I don't, I think that would really turn people off right now to have just a COVID fee. Mm -hmm. um, Jumbo, Claire, or Lynn, do you have any thoughts? I won't be at this point, I will not be putting any additional fee. I mean, we won't be increasing pricing either at this point. I mean, maybe Q1, but no. Mm -hmm. I agree. I don't, I think it's, you know, insult to injury. People just want to come back and I don't want to risk putting any, any additional fees. And Lynn, you're going to probably be doing a little menu. I'm, I'm doing like Jen, I'm rolling out a whole new menu. We're actually going to open in a new location. Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, we're going to redo our menu. One thing that I think I, I was thinking about doing is because of the added time and I was thinking about my more clinical facials, like my radio frequency and maybe peels, doing them more clinically and doing them without the sheets, like setting up more of an exam table kind of thing to kind of cut down on time and money in that way instead of having, so got to kind of see and maybe do some express treatments that, you know, we don't have to maybe raise the price, but we'll save some time and effort on. So, we're, but we're going to look over the whole menu and redo it. So you can figure that in. I know... I've been talking to some clients about um, either doing a slight price increase or, you know, there are some spas that do a um, service fee. Um, you know, so if you can, you know, if that's something you can bear, you know, offering or, you know, calling it a service fee, um, not short term. I mean, it would be long term and it can go towards your expenses of, you know, front desk help laundry, et cetera. Um, I don't have any clients that are putting in um, what I would call a, a COVID fee, um, Deborah. And uh, we agree with you that, um, you know, we might lose clients, you know, because of that. Um, Deborah also asks, um, has anybody ever switched to a flat rate from a commission only scenario? I have not. Um, were you guys ever a flat rate? 
Jen? We were, like yes. Like a per service rate? We were, I'm sorry, a what? A per service rate. Yes, they had a hourly rate for services. So again, that went based on their seniority. So they were all over the place. And then they would so also get more of a flat rate. Right, exactly. Flat rate. And then they would get um, minimum wage for downtime. So you went from flat rate to commission only mm -hmm. rather than the other way. Right. Okay. Um, and Deborah, you might have some questions about that um, because Jen made the uh, decision to go the opposite way. And um, let's see. Wow. Are any of your environments, Jumbo Claire? I don't think this is the case, but um, union employees. Are any of them what? Sorry, Julie. I can't hear you. Union? Oh, there you go. No, no, we're not union. There are departments within casino in the casino that are, but our department is not. Okay. Um, uh, da -da. So no, Deborah, none of um, these are union properties. And let's see, well, that's all the questions that I have here in the chat. Does anybody else have any questions that they want to have answered? And then I had some email questions come up. Um, so uh, this question is, if you have a 50-50 service split currently, and you need to be more profitable. What are some strategies for going forward to put more business, more profit into the business? Do you have suggestions um, for the spa that's currently 50-50 split? They're gonna have to stabilize their, their payroll. So even if they say, okay, so you're getting $50 on a massage now, then keep them at that 50 and raise prices and increase sales. Like they have to stabilize that somehow. To, to lower the percentage. Yes. Yeah. I, I think it, that's pretty hard to, to make a profit, cover your expenses, and then give your service provider 50%. Is very hard, right? Um, so, any you know suggestions on you know how how we could do this? You know, less pain with less pain. Um, you know, I feel like team-based pay, you know, might be the way to go because you need to make a big shift, right? You need to come in and and not say, and, and I've done compensation changes, you know, and, and I've said, you know, you were making 45% and now you're gonna be making 35%. And I know how difficult that can be. Um, you know, and, and luckily, knock on wood, maybe it's the region we're in, you know, we didn't lose staff. And if you're busy enough, you can show them the light, right? You can show them, how they can make up that money by being busy, by selling retail, which I think we should all talk about our requirements to sell retail, you know, because that really does count as income. Um, but if you have to go from 50-50 split, um, I would like to do a total 360 and be like, this is what we're gonna do and it's so exciting and it's called team-based pay and this is why it's gonna work and Lynn Tuss, how that could work. Um, we have questions that they want to hear more about breaking down team-based pay, how to introduce team-based pay. Lynn, give us the details. Okay. So that, like I said, you have to stabilize that, right? That 50-50 commission, you can't, you can't lower somebody's pay because they're just going to hate you forever, right? So you got to you got to stabilize that. You have to stop the bleeding. So what you would do is you would figure out how much this, these people are making. There's a formula. And then you switch that over to hourly. Once you switch them over to hourly, you teach them how to increase sales, sell retail, 
And so then this way you've stabilized your payroll, but now your income is going up. When you're bringing new people in, they're not going to be starting at the same rate, obviously. And, and then you start bringing them up and, and it'll start to balance out and stabilize with them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Did it take so. you a little while to stabilize? Well, okay. So I knew I was go going this route. So I kind of had everybody on hourly. <laughs> But I paid them for every hour they were there, so it ended up being, you know, pretty pretty decent. Um, but the, the thing that I really like about team-based pay is it's more about attitude than it is about numbers. It's not about the the big, that person that's getting that 50% commission might be bringing a lot of money in, but they might not have a great attitude where you get somebody else who's not making a lot of money, but they have a great attitude and they're really good for the team and they help you hit your goals and they're, they're good in other ways. You know, like I have an example, I moved out of my spa this weekend and I had 10 girls volunteer all weekend with a big old smile on their face. I just said, who can help me out? And they all came and did it. And they actually helped me through it because they all had a really good attitude and it wasn't a really easy weekend for me, you know? So it, it just, it, you just have to stabilize the payroll, I guess. And um, the best way to do that is figure out and put them on hourly. Right. So does it, does their paycheck fluctuate weekly, Lynn? Uh, their tips. So that's where the fluctuation the, is. Yeah, they get, I mean, they, well, they get, well, they do, we worked up to paid vacations and sick days. Um, sometimes if they do, sometimes a contest, they'll get a free PTO day. Um, if we're doing some kind of contest or something, because that's what they like, paid time off. Um, so we, I, I, for, I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> oh, their paychecks fluctuate. No, they're pretty much, they're guaranteed. You know, they work, if I tell them they're going to work 40 hours, they get 40 hours a week. So sometimes when they, like, it goes a long time and they get no time off and they're working really hard, I'll give them the option to leave early if it's slow, but they never have to leave because they're always entitled to their pay. So. I like it. Um Lynn, do you have any, so Lynn is, so Lynn is the owner um, of her spa, um, Beauty Mark Jen in the blue um, is the owner of her spa, and Jembo Claire in the red is um, the spa director of her spa. Lynn, do you have anyone else on your management team? Yes. And I how are they paid? Um, is the manager in your team? Do they get more money than everyone else? The, well, she gets paid more. And not, they don't all make the same hourly. They make what they're worth. They get raises. So um, she makes more per hour. She's part of team. She's part of the team bonus. And you know, every every three months when they they're hitting goal, that we do wage reviews, and then they get a raise. So, so you're telling me I'm being facetious um, that they get merit-based raises. Yes. And it's more on behaviors than result. Well, you're going to get the results with the behaviors, but it's not, it's not just about the productivity and the sales number and the retail number. It's really about that effort, the attitude, their, 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 their activity and, you know, being an active part of the team, being a motivating part of the team. So let's just be clear. I want to be clear so everyone understands. Um, all of Lynn's team is not earning the same. Um, so they're earning different rates based on experience. You, when you bring someone in, they start at one level and then they work, continue to work up. And yeah. do they ever plateau? Well, we have a broadband. So it says, this is what, this is what this pay level looks like. And when you accomplish this, then, then we start looking at the next pay level. And this is what this looks like. And what I like about it is it's all mapped out. So it's not like a, um, I, it's just my mood if I give you a raise or not. No, this is what we're working for. And we have one-on-ones every month. It's like, okay, this is what you need to work on to get to that level where you're going to be up for your next raise. And then also hitting bonus every month gets them wage reviews too, so. And do you, post, do, you do any competitive, um, you know, post, like post their, tracking their success? You know, oh, of course their, we do. Talk we about that a little bit. We have a scoreboard in the back, the whole team scoreboard, our, our 
uh, what goes on at our retail percentage, our retail total dollars, our sales dollars, our pre-reserve, our happiness, which is our our closing thing. It's a strategies thing. It's it's actually making the recommendation for the next visit and making a, a retail recommendation. And we call it happiness. So, and the happiness is the responsibility of the technician and the receptionist. And if everybody does their job, we get a credit for getting happiness. So our goal is always 100% happiness. Um, and we track all of that on our big board. And then we'll pick something different every month. We'll be like, all right, let's let's do a pre-reserve contest this month. Let's do a retail percentage this month. Let's do a retail number of items this month, just to like to have fun competitions with the girls. Awesome. I have a question for Lynn also, because I think that the only time I've heard about team-based pay was either small or mid-sized businesses. Do you think that it could be successful in a larger business? Because I know that, you know, with all of the different requirements there, it's very time consuming. So if you had, you know, 20 employees instead of seven, do you think that it could still work successfully? I don't, I don't know how you could do 20 employees without it. <laughs> oh, really? just, it's just, I mean, the communication, the relationship I have with my team and the understanding they have, I mean, they know what, the, the transparency of the whole thing, like they trust me. Like I called them up, I said, listen, we're closing down shop, we're going somewhere else. And they said, okay, let's go. Like to, to build that kind of trust in that relationship, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Like when I wasn't doing team-based pay and I wasn't transparent, I didn't have that communication with my team. You'd always have that somebody stealing your something and going somewhere else and like, or, or no, no notice quitting. And like, if somebody's gonna leave me, I have a year's notice because they're going off to college. And like, I just, or if they're, they're finishing college and they're going off to their next thing. Like I have so much notice when these people leave me now. And it, it's, it's nice because it's like stability for me. That makes sense. I love it. Um, well, we're just about at four o'clock. So if anybody has any last minute questions, um, shoot, just drop them into the chat right now so we can get your questions answered. We will um, send you the recording as well as um, an outline of the takeaways. And um, we've been following up all of our webinars with a blog. So we're going to write a blog about this and have Jen, Jen, and Lynn kind of edit it and add um, their wisdoms into it so that you have many different resources. We'll also include their contact details. Um, Betty's asking who trained you on team-based pay. Betty, I know Lynn is in the thick of strategies. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn goes to all of the big strategies events. And, you know, we, we love Neil at strategies. And, um, you know, I, I have talked to several of my clients about team-based pay because isn't it about a culture? And if you can't create that culture, I mean, Jen and Jen have successfully been able to create the culture at their locations, but really, wouldn't you say, Lynn, it's about the culture. Of it, just, it just gives me, it gave me clarity and confidence where I know I'm doing the right thing and I'm taking care of my people and they know I'm taking care of them. And it just, uh, it just, it just made, I mean, I'd been doing it 10 years before this, but it just really helped clarify things for me. And like, I don't, I'm not like advocating for strategies. I don't work for them or anything. It just, I know it's helped me a lot. And I do know that they give a free coaching call the first time if you're interested. And I do know the first thing you start with is incubator. If you're going to take a class and it explains, it breaks down every piece of what, what you need to do to get started. Mm-hmm. Um, and so right before we go, I know we're at 401, but I'd love to hear from each of you, um, or we sort of know from Lynn already, but how important, I want to impress upon everyone that's still on the call, how important retail is to your business, um, to the expectation of your team, holding them accountable to these retail goals, and, you know, can increase their income. Um, so let's start with uh, Jen Beauclair. 
Yes. Retail is, um, for us, it's huge. You know, like most others, we, especially the estheticians, the estheticians are always our easy, our easy sellers. And, you know, it's, it's built into them that this is an extension of the service. For us, a lot of our clients are transient, so we don't know when they're coming back. So to get them the right products to take home to extend their service is very, very important. And we've had huge success with retail events, retail competitions, when, you know, we look at our calendar for the year and we forecast those slow times. So we really put the emphasis on the retail going into that. And surprisingly enough, like, even though it's a slower, we have less bodies, but the retail carries us through. Awesome. And um, Beauty Mark, Jen? Um, for us with retail, it, it ties back to the passion and the expertise. <laughs> don't necessarily look at retail, and I don't think my employees do I mean, we could put goals in the back room, but for us, it's not necessarily, I would say about a dollar amount. It's about being the best estheticians that we could be. We offer the best product and how can we lead with our expertise? So we're recommending the right products. And I, we go back to science um, and education. And I, I think I would say my, my estheticians and myself being an owner operator, very much were driven by skin science and knowledge necessary more than I would say goals. Um, so making sure the clients have the right products and we're giving the best service that we can be, be giving and we're using the most exclusive products and partnering with the awesome vendors that we do carry. Um, so we're getting continual, tra we train all the time. That's our motivation, constantly training, constantly learning, constantly introducing something new into this, um, the clinic, and I, that just keeps everybody motivated. Jen, will you let everyone know your primary skincare brand? Um, it's Biologique Recharge and um, Environ, I would say too. But. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Just because there was a question that came through about what products you're using. So Jen is a testament that you can use. She's using, you know, high quality, high price point products and, you know, still managing a business that can be financially um, profitable and rewarding. So kudos to you, Jen. I just want to say one other thing, like Lynn was yeah. saying, every, everybody's attitude, like our attitude is so important um, that our full team is on the same page. Like when you work at Beauty Mark, we, ha we have the similar, we have similar interests. You know, we, we love nutrition and we love looking at skin science. So the more I can do to bring our team together, whether it's bringing an expert in, even from not necessarily from the skincare world, but maybe a nurse practitioner to talk to us about um, hormone health. It, it just seems to keep us all together, motivated, and um, learning. Engaged. I love it. And um, Lynn, how about you talk about retail just for a minute and how it helps? It's just like, like Jen said before, it's your professional obligation. You can't give somebody a $150 facial and not send them home with the right product to use. It's, it's just part of the job. You're, you're a professional. You don't go to the doctor and he says, get an antibiotic. And they say, well, maybe we'll get it. No, maybe you want an antibiotic. No, you need this. So <laughs> that's, that's our job. They're going to go buy something anyway. We might as well tell them what they need. Love it. And towards the end of our webinar series, we're going to have a, um, an, a bonus webinar about retail sales. So that'll be in probably about nine weeks. Um, and so one more question, because I know we've gone over, let's see, Rose, I saw you had a question. Um, so I feel like this is directed towards Lynn. Um, so if, if you start somebody hourly, um, what do you start them at? 
Um, right now, well, it, it would depend. I mean, right now I've only hired so far, well, everybody in my spa starts at the front desk. And right now I've only hired not super experienced people because I like to train them the way I do. So I start them at the minimum wage, $11, $11 an hour. You know, in a month I give them a review and another two months I give them another review, get them up to 12 and then they start working on raises. But they're getting paid the whole time they're there and, they're, and we spend most of that time training them. So once they learn the desk, then we train them on the floor. And um, and what does their advancements look like? So is it a percentage? Is it like 50 cents, a dollar? Like how do you it, figure out it how so that- It depends. In the beginning, it's a little more, it's a little more quickly. You know, I try and like in the first three months, try and get them at least a dollar. And then, um, but you got to really understand the first three, six months, I'm training them. I'm not like, they're, they're kind of costing us. So, and then we start, you know, then they, once they get to that three month mark, then like once we get them on the floor, then like there's another raise and then they just go into the team base. And even from day one, if we hit a bonus, they get the same equal amount as everybody else. So they, they get right into that right away. Rose, does that help answer that question? Okay. Rose says yes. Okay, good. <laughs> so I think um, I think we've answered all the questions. Thank you, ladies, for taking time out of this uh, beautiful sunny day. We're all in the Northeast, so I think our weather is pretty similar. Lynn, you might be a little hotter than the rest of us. It's hot today, yeah. <clears throat> but up here in Maine, we're going to hit, I think, 87 at some point this week. So... Stay cool. Um, we'll hope to see everyone on the coffee chat, which is Thursday, where we have an open forum conversation. Also, um, we'll go back to our regular, regularly scheduled webinars next Monday at 3 o'clock, where we're going to be talking to um, a panel, two representatives. We're going to talk to um, Damien from Body Work Mall, and we're going to talk to Darnell from Universal Companies. And we're going to talk um, supply vendors, how to, you know, maximize your relationships with supply vendors, how they can help you. Um, I don't want to see you running to Sally's, you know, buying stuff. Let's build this foundation step by step so that when you reopen, you have the new successful business that you've always wanted and continue to grow. So thank you, Jen, Jen, and Lynn for being on the panel. As always, they're a wealth of experience and knowledge. I will share their contact details so that you can reach out to them via email or be sure to follow each of them um, on social media. Thanks again and have a great day. Thanks.